I hope that you guys are all well. I hope that you're taking advantage and making the most, it seems, of this uh, post-corona kind of time. Not post-corona, sorry. It's not officially post-corona for any of us, but uh, for this kind of weird transitional time, I don't know about you all, uh, but we're doing, like, things are really loosening up right now, so I'm kind of, kind of like, weirded out for the past few days. Uh, let us know how things are going. Inshallah, it will be post-corona soon. May Allah make it easy. To be honest, there's a lot of parts of like a lot of benefit in terms of the habits and the routine that we benefited from and the, that we built in Corona that I do hope that we take forward uh, from this inshallah on the Ramadan sorry the al 360 even I have struggled with that that title uh, in that group we will be starting a gratitude series and uh, this week is actually that the topic for this week is reconnecting so inshallah we'll be tying that in to our experience right now assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I see you warahmatullahi wa barakatuh can you hear me Yes, Alhamdulillah, we can hear you. We can see the light is a little dim this time around. Uh, is there some way to increase it just a little bit or is it kind of out of our control? Uh, let me see, Bismillah. The light, okay. Uh, I, I put a lamp on my face. I hope inshallah it's uh, a bit better now. A little bit better, yeah, yeah, yeah. It got a little bit better, Alhamdulillah. Okay, Alhamdulillah. perfect. So we are set. I'm just gonna make sure everyone on Facebook, please say your salams. Uh, and introduce yourselves if you can see us, uh, inshallah, and then we'll kick it off. It's actually exactly four o'clock, so the timing is perfect. Alhamdulillah, I do see our Facebook stream is ready to go. So bismillah, welcome everyone. Alhamdulillah that we've had the opportunity of having, this is now the fifth session of the Ottoman Empire series. And uh, to just to, just to give you guys some more to look forward to, inshallah, we have locked you in, Sheikh, for uh, another couple of sessions uh, for the leadership lessons from the Ottoman Empire series. So you have a lot more to look forward to, uh, inshallah, every Thursday moving forward again at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, so today is the fifth session. Now, Sheikh, I'm going to let you recap us because honestly, it's been a hectic week and even I've uh, forgotten some of what we learned. I know we covered the, the end of Uturu. And where were we transitioning uh, when we were moving forward until uh, where we are covering this session? What are we covering today? Hi. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, everyone. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So last week we covered uh, the second part of Artughrul. We just uh, talked about his, uh, his role in that there was two Muslim armies fighting each other. There was the Suljuks and there was the Khawarizmis. The problem is the Khawarizmis are the one who started the war after having a peace treaty with the Muslim Suljuks against the Mongolians. Unfortunately, after five years of peace, they got greedy, they betrayed them, and they also uh, seeked help from the Christian kingdom of Trobizond. When Abdurrah arrived, he saw two Muslims fighting each other Initially, he did not know which party is on the truth, but when he saw the Christians are fighting on one side, he said then the truth must be with the other side. He went with the Suljuks, and he fought the Khawarizm and the, uh, the kingdom of Trobizond. And after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of his interference in the battle, he was able to give them a decisive victory. And since then, uh, Artughrul has always been in the front of the Suljuk army and he was nicknamed Muqaddimatu as Sultan, which means the front of the Sultan. The Sultan is referring to Alauddin Qaykubad, the ruler of uh, the Suljuks and the best friend of Artughrul. And this relationship just became stronger with time. Every time Artughrul wins the battle for uh, the Suljuks, uh, Sultan Alauddin would gift him another uh, uh, town. First, he gifted him uh, Sugut. Sugut became the first, uh, I don't want to call it capital because it's still a small tribe with a land. It's not yet a state. But they kept growing that uh, by the time Artur died, 4,500 square kilometers were under his control, he and his, uh, and his tribe. And they were uh, very wise in not trying to shake the hornet's nest, which is the uh, the hornet here referring to the Byzantine Empire. They were just attacking small towns that the Byzantine Empire did not care about much. And that's how their power grew, alhamdulillah. So that was a recap for last week. 
Um, She's not going to here for that recap. That okay? That 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 tri- t- tickles all my memories again. I'm glad that you that you went through that everything. Just like Malakir for that. Um, I'm kind of confused as well because we did do Alhamdulillah. We went and we did a bit of rewind rewind of the first session. So for those of you who are catching up in the group, we have one more session rewind for the second session for you to catch up, and then you will be all caught up to the fifth lesson, which is what we are covering today. And then of course next week will be the sixth, and the following will be the seventh. So we're very excited to continue our journey with the Ottoman Empire series. Just like Malakir once again for giving us with this experience, uh, Dr. Walid, I'm going to pass it off to you and inshallah we'll see you at the end for questions and answers. Bismillah. Right. Bismillah. Jazakumullah khairan. Inshallah, before I start, I would like to share a link with you uh, because alhamdulillah there is good news and many people have been emailing me and asking me about it. Uh, a lot of people saw that the European Union has reopened to almost uh, many countries but not to America. But alhamdulillah, Turkey, the country, has opened to everyone. For now, anyone could go to Turkey. And I could say from what I've seen and what people have been there is that if any country in the world is prepared for uh, COVID-19, Turkey, alhamdulillah, the airports, the sanitization is top level. The planes are top level, mashallah. And even how they organize things inside the country. And that's good news, alhamdulillah, that those of you who love this uh, course and love Al-Tughrul, inshallah, you have a chance now, alhamdulillah, to go to Turkey. And I personally, myself, inshallah, most likely will go there at the end of August. We're still contemplating whether we would make a tour or not. But here is how you could voice your opinion and make it happen, inshallah. Uh, I've created a short survey. It's only two to three minutes. And it would be very helpful, inshallah, if you just take that time to let us know about your travel aspirations, not only in, in the summer, but later. So that survey, it's on ilmpath.com slash survey. If you go there, inshallah, maybe just bookmark the link. And after the class, you do the survey. You would really help us a lot, inshallah. And if you do put your email, whenever I release a new ebook, just like those of you who got the first Ottoman ebook, then inshallah, you will also be receiving that. Those who do follow me know that I don't spam. Alhamdulillah. Only when there is something important, I send you a message inshallah. So, uh, that's about Turkey and traveling to Turkey inshallah. Uh, now, today, chronologically, we are supposed to speak about the next ruler uh, after the death of Abdul rahimahullah and those of you, inshallah, who go to Sugut, the town that uh, Alauddin Qaytubat gifted him, will see that everyone you know from his family members and he himself are buried over there. And subhanAllah, the Tur- Turkey knows the importance of their, of their initial founder, that there are guards protecting the grave of Artugrul 24 hours, and they are dressed the same way that people were dressed during the Qayi tribe. People love to see Every hour on the hour, they have uh, the exchange of the soldiers protecting. And there is like a, a small parade that they do. So that's something to, uh, beautiful to witness for those who go there. Uh, subhanAllah. That grave of Abdul is so important that the Greeks, even in World War I, they went and they shot at it. If you were actually to go there, you would see the bullet holes on the grave of Abdul rahimahullah because they wanted to... Uh, dishonor the the beginning of the Ottoman Empire, but Subhanallah, whoever Allah Subhanahu wa Taala honors, no one could dishonor them. For now, there is more than ever people visiting the town to learn about the history of that family, the family of Al Tughra Rahimahullah, and how from their offspring an empire has grown. And of course, when we talk about the empire, it's not called the Al Tughra Empire. Al Tughra started it. Uh, he raised his son very well. It is called the Ottoman because it's named after Usman, rahimahullah, the eldest son of Artugrul. So that's what we were going to talk about, inshallah. However, just keep in mind, I've done an entire lecture on uh, Usman. Uh, it was the last weekend of Ramadan for Faith Essential. And it's on the student portal, inshallah. Uh, you are able to hear the full story of Rosman over there. And perhaps for the Facebook, inshallah, they could put it live on you sometime for this week if you haven't seen it before. So therefore, today, I will just briefly uh, revise 
so that we don't miss the, chronologic, the chronological order. Briefly revise what we mentioned about Usman, and you could find the full lecture, inshallah, on the portal. And then, inshallah, after that, we go and we see how his efforts became the foundation and how his son, Ul Khan, really established the Ottoman state. Right. For a recap, Usman, you know, the year he's born is 1258. And that year is very important. Uh, because that year, it's, it's 656 in Hijra, that is the same year that one of the most important events in the history of the Muslim Ummah happened. And it is one of the biggest catastrophes, actually, in the history of the Ummah, if not maybe, subhanAllah, one of the top three. And that is the fall of the city of Baghdad. Why Baghdad is so important? We mentioned that it is the capital of the Abbasi Empire, and it is the largest city in the world at that time. Not only the largest Muslim city, but the largest city at all period. About 2 million people lived, and that was, that was huge at that time. We're talking about a time when the population of the earth was just about 350 million. Just the population of the United States. And also the biggest library in the world was over there, uh, and it is the House of Wisdom. 400,000 books in that library, the center of knowledge, the center of the economy, the center of the, the, the caliphate and everything. But it got attacked by the Mongolians under the, uh, under the leadership of uh, Hulagu, yes? And Hulagu seized the city for 14 days and uh, at that time, the Muslims were so divided, they were so weak, that there was hardly any resistance. That when the Khalifa went out, uh, based on an advice from a traitor, his own minister was a double agent for the Mongolians. He told him, go out and take all the scholars and all the judges with you to ask Hulaku to not invade you, and perhaps he will listen. And of course, this was a golden chance. Unfortunately, Hulaku killed all the ulama, anyone who has a potential leadership, uh, a potential leadership qualifications was assassinated. Then he went inside the city and he massacred the two million Muslims inside the city, subhanAllah. So much that the river in Iraq, the rivers became red from the blood of the Muslims who no one was spared. No one, people were hiding inside wells, people were hiding inside mosques, people were hiding on top of the roof of the buildings. They were thrown from the top. It was a catastrophe. It, but, but even subhanAllah, when you compare it to anything that is happening today, this was much, 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 much larger. But that same year, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will that someone else is born who will revive the honor of the Ummah again that same year Osman Ghazi was born. And, and, and those who are listening to this for the first time, why did this happen to the Muslims? Aren't they the ones who are carrying the message of Allah? Well, unfortunately, the streets of Baghdad were full of bars. They were full of prostitution houses. We're talking about if this is the capital of the Ummah, what about the rest of the Muslim world? Just think about that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, the same message that we repeat, that he said in Surah Muhammad, ayah number 38, and if you turn away from the path of Allah, he will replace you with other people. So the replacement was happening. The, the uh, Abbasis failed to carry the message, and now the Ottoman hero is born, and he will revive the message of the Ummah again. For Osman Ghazi, we said in the beginning, he was a judge. Uh, uh, Al-Tughrul appointed him as a judge. Why? To teach him justice, to teach him to practice justice. And he was so good in that role that, and so just, subhanAllah, that there was a story that he gave the judgment to a Christian man over a Muslim man from his own people, and that Christian man ended up accepting Islam. And we also mentioned that his relationship became stronger with his sheikh, his sheikh name is Ida Bali, who was also the sheikh of Al Tughrul. Uh, those who watch Al Tughrul show see Ibn Arabi. No, it was not historically. Ibn Arabi never met Al Tughrul. It was Ida Bali, the one, Sheikh Ida Bali, the one who taught Al Tughrul, a master of the Hanafi fiqh and a master of the science of hadith. 
and actually, and he studied in Damascus. And because of this, the Ottoman influence, the Ottoman influence, uh, yes, Kurulush Art Osman fans should know. Yes, I'm not following this show, so I don't honestly know if they showed him or not yet. Did they show Sheikh Idabali? I'm sure by now they would have shown him, right? Right, good, alhamdulillah. Fa Sheikh Idabali, uh, he studied in Damascus, and because of that influence, the Hanafi madhab became the almost the uh, the standard madhab of the Ottoman Empire. They did not try to force the Hanafi madhab on all the Muslim world, but they said as far as courts are concerned, the Hanafi madhab was the standard because we want to have a standard. We don't want someone to have different uh, uh, judgment or different ruling in uh, depending on which court they go. Yeah, people will start to find loopholes. But people in their own fiqh, they are free to teach whatever madhab they want. They are free to learn whatever madhab they want. So that way, they were holding the stick from the middle, and that was very wise. Uh, this is the result of why, yeah, until this day, the Hanafi madhab is the largest in the world. About 40% of the Muslim population follow that madhab. And in case you are wondering, someone will say, oh, you're talking very positively. You must be Hanafi, right? Actually, I, I mean, to be honest with you, I'm mixed. My mother, my mother, she's an Islamic teacher. She studied Hanafi. My father studied Shafi'i. I learned both from childhood, alhamdulillah. And I also learned the Hanbali while I was studying uh, in, in Saudi. And then I learned the Maliki independently on my own, alhamdulillah. And we are always, we always try to find whatever, whatever opinion is stronger among this. Or whatever we are, people are following in our locality, inshallah, as long as it's based on authentic evidence. Right. And then we mentioned also, Rasman saw a, a dream, and that dream, he went to Sheikh to his Sheikh Idabali, and talked about this dream about the tree that would cover. He saw a tree growing from the ground, and the roots of the tree are going through the. Uh, Subhanallah, there, there was uh, rivers coming out of that tree, the rivers, uh, water coming out of the tree. It was the rivers of the Nile, the Danube, the Euphrates, the Tigris, and also the roots of the tree are growing uh, from the mountains of the Balkan, of the Caucasus, and the Atlas in North Africa. And the shadow of the tree is, is past Constantinople and passed around, around the Muslim world. And Sheikh Idabali told him, that you and your descendants are going to be ruling the Muslim world. You are the ones who will be trusted to protect the Muslim world. And he saw a moon coming out of the chest of Usman and Idabali, Sheikh Idabali told him, uh, sorry, coming out of the chest of uh, Idabali and going on the lap of Usman. And he told him that the, the interpretation of this is that you will marry my daughter. So Osman marries the daughter of Sheikh Idabali. They had a huge ceremony uh, where in front of the uh, grave of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu uh, and uh, Idab Sheikh Idabali gave the sword to Osman and this ceremony kept happening with every subsequent Sultan until the very last one, Sultan uh, Muhammad the sixth. And you could actually find, uh, watch the very last one on YouTube. Just type Muhammad the Sixth, uh, girding of the sword. And you could, uh, the, for the very last time, it was filmed by the New York Times in, uh, actually, since today is the 2nd of July, it happened on the 4th of July, 1918. Uh, and, that, and that sword is still preserved in the palace of Topkapi until this day. But that was briefly about Osman's beginnings. And we said the most important accomplishment that he made, uh, it was mentioned actually by Ibn Battuta, the famous traveler, who was going in those lands at that time, uh, in the Ottoman lands, yeah, in the west of Turkey. And he said that uh, Osman made uh, a union for each of the trades that they had at that time. Blacksmith, uh, the uh, carpenters, the uh, tailors, every type of job had a union. And that union was not like a union today, just about wages and, and that. No, each union had a sheikh 
who is an expert in the fiqh of that job. And that way, the people are always connected to their sheikh when it comes to fiqh matters related to their job. SubhanAllah, look how advanced. Yeah, I wish we have something like this today. And not only this, that union, the people from the same job, their families would meet. They would know each other. And that way, the relationship became stronger. And also, the quality of the goods became better because they are helping each other, training each other. We could see the offshoot of this today when you go to the Grand Bazaar in Turkey, in Istanbul. And you could see many of these trades survived from that time, subhanAllah, all these handicrafts. And we said also this step has, uh, was very instrumental in the spread of Islam in uh, the Ottoman lands at that time. How? Because after some time, these unions were opened for non-Muslims as well. Non-Muslims came in and they saw how good uh, Muslims' manners are and how they're treating them. And they saw their daily life. And this caused these non-Muslims to accept Islam as a process and also become uh, part, uh, like higher rank in those unions. So that was the time of Rusman, rahimahullah. Uh, and he was able to open several small towns like his father, Artur. One town is called uh, Billacek. And, uh, and all of them are in northwest part of Turkey, of Turkey. And another town called Bathyus. But then the most important town that he will try to open, it's a big city now, it's called Bursa. Bursa at that time was one of the three most important uh, Byzantine cities. And it actually the most important on the Turkish side. Outside, Istanbul is number one. Yeah? And Thessaloniki in Greece is number two. And Bursa is one of those three. And what happened is normally, the Ottomans at that time, still very small compared to the, uh, to the Byzantine Empire, it would be, they would be unmatched if they tried to do this. But however, something happened that made the Ottomans say, this is an opportunity. It may never happen again. What happened? There was uh, the, the emperor of the Byzantines. His name is John V. His grandson, John VI, revolted against his grandfather. So as a result of this, John VI, from that revolt, he brought the Serbs and the Greeks and he turned them against the emperor. Because of this instability inside the Byzantine Empire, Osman, in the year three, uh, 1320, which is 720 Hijra, he said, this is an opportunity that may never happen again. While the Byzantines are busy with a civil war, let us seize the city of Bursa. City of Bursa is one of the most protected cities in the world at that time. If you actually go there today, subhanAllah, the city walls, part of the city walls still exist. And you will see why it was difficult. They are some of the thickest and strongest city walls in the world. This did not deter Osman. So he besieged that city for three years. Could you imagine this? That's, that's over 1,000 days. But subhanAllah, while besieging that city, while besieging that city, Osman... Uh, became sick and during the siege he rahimahullah passed away and this happened to Osman in the year 1323 some will say you have those are watching uh, the Osman so you say you have burned the ending for us like no this is history and you should learn as we said history you should learn it from the sources of history right not from dramas 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 people watch them for entertainment Sometimes they, are, they have halal things. Sometimes they have haram things. Yeah, I will let you judge that. You know what's halal and what's haram based on what you watch. But when, you, when we want to learn history, we learn it from the authentic sources. So Usman rahimahullah died and you could see his grave today uh, in the city of Bursa. What we're going to talk about today, that was just a quick recap. The full episode is on the, uh, the uh, Faith Essential. 
Uthman, when, when, remember, when Abdul Rahimahullah, when he first had the first victory and he got Sugut, he only had 2,000 square kilometers under him. And by the end of his life, he had 4,500. So he almost doubled the amount of land that he was able to conquer. Uthman started from 4,500. And by the end of his life, he increased the land under Ottoman rule to 16,000. So four multiples. Yeah. You will see the subhanAllah, the early sultans, their growth was exponential. Uh, in addition to Sugut, he has Domanich, Guyanuk, Belichik. He almost has a, the big part of the northwest of Turkey, but not yet the city that the Prophet them promised for someone, for a special leader. He doesn't yet have Constantinople. Actually, he doesn't even yet have Bursa. Yeah. So what happened to Bursa after Osman died? Before we say that, we must talk about Osman's son, which his name is Orhan Ghazi. O-R-H-A-N. But H is pronounced Kha. So it's Orhan Ghazi. Orhan Ghazi. Orhan Ghazi was born. Yeah. Orhan Ghazi was born 1281. Does anyone remember what happened in 1281? 1281 is the year Artughrul Rahimahullah died. So Artughrul just saw the birth of his grandson, Orhan the next sultan, and then he died shortly after. Yeah. Fa Urkhan was born, and like the rest of the family, they are all born near the city of Sugut. Uh, and that was 682 in al Hijra. Urkhan happens to be the oldest son for Osman as well. And he grew very close to his father. Uh, when his father died, Osman, Orhan was 42 years old when he became the Sultan. Orhan, during the siege, what would he do after his father died? Should he continue or should he go step back? What happened is he left the army to be surrounding Bursa and just went to do the ceremony to be the next leader of the Kaya tribe. Yeah, it's still Kaya tribe. It's still it's on the way of becoming a state. And then he went back and continued the siege of Bursa for another three years. Before we talk about the siege, what is the description of Urkhan? Because I know when we talk about people, uh, when we talk about something that happened in the past, some people have difficulty imagining it. So it's always good to talk about a description of a person so that we could at least be able to imagine who they are. So who exactly is Urkhan? He was described by historians as someone who is very tall. He, is, he has a blonde hair and he has a fair skin and blue eyes. So he doesn't look like the typical Turkic person at that time. He looked a bit different. And you could actually see a, a concept image uh, or, or uh, a concept portrait of Urkhan by simply searching his name. As I said, anyone before, uh, anyone before uh, SubhanAllah, Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih, we have their drawing based on descriptions, right? Bayezid, Sultan Bayezid also had a drawing made by one of the Italian artists. Uh, but uh, anyone after Usman Ghazi, the portrait you see is actually how they look like because there was artists at that time who were drawing how the sultans looked like. Yeah? But what you, what you find before, other than Bayezid and, uh, and, and Muhammad al-Fatih, what you find before Muhammad al-Fatih is just a concept portrait based on the description. Urkhan was, he was described as someone who was very respectful, beloved by his people, compassionate, and he was a, peop a people's person, meaning what? He loved mixing among the people. He loved being involved with the public. He loved listening to their problems and concerns. What we call today, 
he's an extrovert. Yeah, you will see uh, many types of leaders in the history of our ummah. Some of them were introverts. They they are wise. They are intelligent, but they are they are not very well mixing with the people. And some were uh, extroverts who were. Uh, who were, who love to go among the people and give khubbas and talk to them. And by the way, both of both introverts and extroverts could be great leaders. So if you're an introvert, don't misunderstand me that I'm saying that uh, extroverts are a better leader. No, in history, we have successful leaders from each of those types. I mean, Abu Bakr, عنه, the first leader of the ummah, he was generally described as an introvert. Umar ibn al-Khattab, an extrovert. We, we could talk about all the characteristics of the Sahaba radiallahu in another time. But uh, we could observe that quality in Urkhan. Also, again, mashallah, Sheikh Idabali lived very long and he was also the one who taught Urkhan the Islamic sciences. So he taught Artughrul and he taught Usman and he also lived long enough to teach Urkhan as well. Um, and that, that Islamic upbringing that Urkhan had caused him to be also to, to take care of the scholars among his people and of the Hufad of the Quran. So he was generous to them because he believed that being generous to them would help them in their mission of spreading knowledge. Um, Urkhan's motivation. Yeah, was just like the motivation of his ancestors. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, Constantinople will be conquered. What a great army that army would be and what a great prince that prince would be. Everyone wants to be that prince. Urkhan, by the way, his importance, before we even talk about his accomplishments, historians said, if it wasn't for Urkhan, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if it wasn't for Urkhan, we would not even know the name of Usman today or al tughrul Maybe we would know them like in a footnote. But Urkhan is the one who will put the Ottoman Empire on the map of history. Yeah? Urkhan, his foundation after Usman, each one is building on the next one. But that's what historians said specifically about Urkhan. He's the one who will take his father's land and truly turn it into a state, finally, a fully functional state. And that's why many historians say that, uh, you know, that Urkhan might be the true founder of the Ottoman Empire, and it should be called the, uh, the Urkhanite Empire, yeah? But Osman sounds better, of course. Uh, Osman, I forgot to mention something, by the way. Someone will say, how come all the leaders from the, uh, from the Ottomans have... Turkic names like Ertugrul and Urkhan, but Usman has an Arabic name, Uthman. Actually, the real name, and I mentioned this before, but a uh, reminder the real name of Uthman was actually a Turkic name, it was Ataman. Ataman, A T A M A N. However, once once the Ottomans became, became a stronger state, they wanted to have the honor of connection to one of the names of the Sahaba. Anhum. So Ataman became Uthman. So now you know why they call it the Ottoman Empire or the Dawla al Dawla al Uthmani after Uthman, because again, the Ottomans loved the Sahaba. Anhum. And that's why always the ceremony uh, of, the, of the new sultan was done in front of the grave of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. And that's why also they wanted to be called uh, Dawla Ruthmaniya after a Sahabi radiallahu anhum that the founder. And that perhaps tells us why it is called that way. I'm sure for many of you, this is new information, right? Um, Ruthman also, his, uh, sorry, Urkhan, his importance is that he is the first among the Muslims in history to be successful into crossing into Europe. 
crossing into the European mainland. There were 16 failed attempts before him. For that, for what did Osman do to be successful? And how could things escalate to the point that now the Ottomans are able to even cross in the domain of the Byzantines? That's what we find out, inshallah, when we talk about the story of, Osman, of, of Urkhan. So after Urkhan, after Osman's death, we said Urkhan briefly left the army around the Bursa and he went for the ceremony to be the next sultan. However, before that ceremony happened, there was a discussion between him and between his other brother, whose name is Alauddin. So Osman had another son, his name is Alauddin. Urkhan, first of all, offered Alauddin, his brother, that they would both be co-leading the state that their father left behind. Now, should Alauddin accept this offer? What do you think? Does it make sense that uh, a state would have two leaders? You know, as much as Osman, this is something, by the way, this shows us that Osman is a very noble person. Because many people are hungry for power and they just want to consolidate all the power in their hands. But Osman did not want to have divisions with his siblings. So he offered this gesture of a goodwill to Alauddin. But Alauddin refused and said, the ummah must not be divided. This could be a dangerous precedent. And you know, you don't know any company in the world that has two CEOs, right? There is only one CEO. Yes, there could be, of course, board of directors and shura members. Yeah. But the leader, the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that the leader is one leader. We have one khalifa. Yeah, sometimes in history we had more than one khalifa, but that's another story. That was the exception. And the same thing Allah tells us in the Quran that this universe cannot have more than one God. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this in a logical way because people would be asking about this. And he said, yeah? If there was in the heavens and the earth any God other than Allah, there would have been corruption. Why? The Quran explains in another place. If there was two gods, one of them would try to fight the other to have total control. So it's not possible, logically, to have two gods. And in the same way, the sunnah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put on this earth, it is not possible to have two leaders for the same organization. Whether that organization is a state, a country, a company, uh, a project, or anything. So that's a very important thing we must learn. But people also should be, the leaders should be training who will succeed them because no one lives forever. Urkhan, after this refusal from his brother, he appointed Alauddin as the Grand Wazir. Wazir is a Turkish word, means minister. So in other words, the prime minister, Grand Wazir, the prime minister. Yeah. Uh, meaning what? Uh, first of all, this word wazir is now used all over the Muslim world uh, to mean minister. So the, it came from Turkish language, but the Arabs are using it and others. Uh, meaning that uh, Urkhan wants to focus on spreading the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wants to focus on the Byzantine Empire and the imminent danger that may come from the Mongolians. And... For that reason, he appointed Alauddin to manage all the civil parts of the land while Urkhan focuses on uh, the conquests. So Alauddin would manage uh, management and civil institutions, but the military command and the finances are in the hand of Urkhan. And in order to for Alauddin, of course, to be able to manage the state, he also needs to have access to some of the finances. So Urkhan gave him all the revenue that will come out of uh, the city that is about to be opened. 
and that is going back to the city of Bursa. So Osman, three year siege, Urkhan had to continue three year siege, another three year siege, until finally 13, 12, uh, 1326, Bursa surrendered. That massive, well protected city of Bursa surrendered and became under Ottoman and under Orkhan's rule. And by the way, during those three years, Orkhan did not just sit and do nothing. Yeah, he would go and try to do conquest to the smaller villages around Bursa. And that way he made himself stronger while waiting for the results to happen with extreme patience. Some will say, why did it take six years? Let me tell you why. Bursa had three, the wall around the city of Bursa is three and a half kilometers long. That's two miles long. That's, by the way, that's massive by the past standards. It has 14 surveillance towers, big ones around the city, and six huge gates. The walls were extremely thick, and at that time, the Ottomans did not have any of the, what we call, um, siege weapons. Yeah, weapons that are made to break a siege. Either big moving ladders or big cannons. Yeah, Someone, the invention of cannons would have to be made for them to finally be able to open the other towns, including Istanbul. But at Urkhan's time, they did not have cannons yet. Yeah. Once they got in, Bursa was made as the new capital of the Ottoman capital because many historians say Sogut was just, uh, again, it was just a land and that was just a village. Bursa is considered by many historians to be the first Ottoman capital. Well, uh, what did Bursa look like? How do we describe it when we go inside? Those of you, inshallah, who, who, those of you who downloaded my book, Seven Glorious Ottoman City, you can find lots of beautiful pictures of Bursa and a very vivid description. Who gave us that description? In 1331, the famous traveler Ibn Battuta arrived and was able to enter the city just five years after it was opened. He was impressed by the Sultan and he said about the city of Bursa the following, with fine bazaars, wide streets, Surrounded on all sides by gardens and running springs, Bursa is one of the most beautiful towns I've seen in the world. That's the words of Ibn Battuta. Ibn Battuta also continued to describe to us Sultan Urkhan because he met him in person. What did he say about Sultan Urkhan? He said, the ruler of, of Bursa, Urkhan Bey, Son of Usman, this Sultan is the greatest among all the Turkic rulers in terms of land, military power, and assets. He continues and he said, Abin Battuta said, he holds about a hundred fortresses. He spends his time by visiting the people in these fortresses, and he stays for a period of time in each of them, and he would try to understand the needs and concerns of his people. Again, we mentioned that's the leader who loves mixing with people, not the ones who sits inside a room and locks himself. Yeah. He said, I heard Urkhan does not stay more than a month in any city as he is continuously fighting with the non believers and conquering their castles and sieging them. When I was visiting Bursa and Iznik, I met this true hero and received a lot of presents from him. In fact, Urkham Ghazi was one of the main people who financed the travels of Ibn Battuta. Ibn Battuta, we said, the greatest maybe traveler in the history, uh, in the modern era, before the modern era where there is planes and there's trains and all that. He was able to travel all the way to Indonesia and back to his hometown in uh, Tanja, Tangier in Morocco, where he's still buried until this day. And he should be thanking, and he did in fact thank 
Sultan Orhan, because the gifts he gave to, to Ibn Battuta, he was able to sell them and have enough money to travel very far. You see, subhanAllah, how beautifully history is connected once we learn about the characters. Who thought that Artughrul and Ibn Battuta are connected through the grandson, Urkhan Ghaz? After that great victory of Bursa, Urkhan now wants to establish a true state. So after all these years in those battles, he sat down and he started, he and a group of knowledgeable people, to write down the laws that would govern the state. And that's why, again, we say that many historians consider Urkhan to be the, the, the true founder. They've written 21 laws that organize the trade in the Ottoman state. Of course, as Muslims, many laws are already laws that we derive from the Quran and from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Islamic law. So Alhamdulillah, most of the work is done for us, but also we always need to take these ayat and ahadith and to write, write how we're going to apply it in our time. How we're going to apply, for example, Islamic finance law when it comes to banking system, when it comes to debit or cards, when it comes to money transfers online and all these things. The laws are there, but they need to be written uh, in a way, and that's called fiqh, to be applicable for the people of that time. The laws are always applicable, but the fuqaha job is to translate that law into something that could be applied at that time and at that place. That's exactly what they were doing. So the 21 laws were written, and there was uh, uh, the, um, the how much the merchants, you remember there was unions for each job, how much money they would, they would have to agree to give to the Sultan in order to do what? To use that money into taking the affairs of the ummah and, and also opening the lands. Now, some will say, isn't that the taxation system? Yes, but it was, it was a beneficiary system. You know, the taxation, for example, in Byzantine lands, the money would go to the uh, Byzantine emperor to lavishly spend it on themselves. Here, why did the merchants invest, we call it investment, into the Ottoman states? Because the more lands, Arthur uh, Urkhan would be able to conquer, then there is more natural resources that would come. So the merchants would also benefit from that investment. And at the same time, the primary intention was to spread the word of Allah as they go around these lands. So it's a system that must be understood of how they applied it in the Ottoman lands. And also something else he added, is quality control check. So each job, whether it's uh, carpenters or blacksmith or uh, tailors or any other handicrafts, there was people now who check the quality control and try to improve it. Similar to how we have today the, you know, the ISO, ISO 9001 standard, there was a standard to be met in each trade. So that helped the quality increase in the time of Urkhan as well. The next town Urkhan has his eyes on is one of the most, again, a very important town. In fact, it's one of the most important towns in for the Christian world. That is the town. In that town, there is a church. That's the church where the, if you heard about the Creed of Nicaea, the Creed of Nicaea is actually the Aqidah of the Christian faith. The Aqidah of the Christian faith was written in the town of Nicaea, which the Turkish people call Izdik. That's the next town Urkhan has his eyes on to be able to, 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 uh, to make a conquest. 
Yeah, and that's another fortified town. Why is Orhan trying to capture every fortified town in the northwest of Turkey? He's trying to have a strong foothold because of what? His eye is on the prize. What is the prize? Constantinople. And as we will see, each of the leaders will add a piece of the puzzle so that when Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih comes, he's ready. He did not do it on his own. Many Muslims think when they read the hadith that he did it on his own. No. He, what he did is succession. Without Bursa opened by Urkhan, we would not be able to open Constantinople later. Without, without Arturul getting subud, it is all uh, an effort that we build on each other. For Iznik, what happened to Iznik, uh, the city where the Aqidah of the Christianity was written, from, 12, from 1328, three years, they would have to do something to be able to open Iznik. That, inshallah, will be our lecture next time, the conquest of Iznik and how Urkhan turned the Ottoman lands to finally be a true state. Jazakumullah khairan. And now I take your questions, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair, Sheikh. Finally, not as much of a cliffhanger as usual. Alhamdulillah, I feel satisfied leaving this session. <laughs> but Jazakumullah khair. Um, let's hop into the Q&A sections. So I see a few that are submitted on Faith Essentials. Everyone else coming in from Facebook and YouTube, please do submit your questions in the comments and I will grab them as fast as we can in the next 10 minutes, inshallah. So the first question is, there is a hadith that says the Prophet said that the Constantinople would be conquered and a wonderful emir and army would conquer it. Does this refer to Mahmud the Great? Yes, the, the, I mean, he's, he, uh, Muhammad II, who we call later Muhammad al-Fatih after the conquest, he is the one indeed who, will, who is finally successful. 28 attempts in 800 years failed to open Constantinople. But however, the attempts of his, of his parents and grandparents is what weakened Constantinople so that it was ready for him. So we could say that it was a group effort uh, that led to Muhammad al-Fatih being able to finally open Constantinople. Beautiful. The next question is, do you recommend reading Usman's Dream by Caroline Finkel? I'm not sure if you're familiar with that book, Shay. Of course. Uh, do I recommend reading that book? Very good. Uh, if you were with us last week, maybe you weren't, I put a list of all the Ottoman resources. So it was uh, ilmpap.com slash Ottoman references. If you type that, inshallah, was there a dash in the, um, in the, in the uh, let me type it and see. Ilmpap.com, Ottoman references. Yes. So Ottoman dash references, mpad.com uh, Ottoman dash references. I do mention that book, Osman's Dream, and I do mention the pros and cons for that book, as well as I believe 18 other books. Each book, I tell you what is the pros, what is the, what is the strength of that book, and what are the weaknesses of that book. And that way, inshallah, when you choose a book to read, you are choosing a book that is good for you, inshallah. Beautiful. The next question is, did Osman's parents see a dream about his birth? Did Osman's parents see a dream about his birth? I honestly have not come across uh, anything about this. If, if someone is asking this because they saw it in the drama, maybe, maybe, I'm not sure, then it, it perhaps maybe, again, the drama wanted to get inspired by Osman's actual dream. And they made another dream about him. But I haven't come across it in any history book I've read. Perfect. The next question is, were there any prophecies that Turks would come into power and rule the world? Were there any prophecies about Turks ruling the world? Well, we could take the hadith of Constantinople as a prophecy. But also, there is another hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that talks about the caliphate. So he said that, that the righteous caliphate will be 30 years. That's Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and Al-Hasan, five, not four, like people think. 
And then he said, and then it will be a kingship that people would bite on, meaning mulk. He said, mulkan adudam. People would bite on it, meaning that they are trying to seek it and everyone is giving it to his own son. And then he said, and then the caliphate will disappear. Tazul. It will, uh, and then it would come again on the path of the prophethood. But does it mention the Turks specifically? It does not mention the Turks specifically. Perfect. Um, just a side note, I think there is an issue with the Facebook stream, at least to the Amalgar page. Um, if you guys are experiencing any issues, if you can't see me, please let us know. Otherwise, we are near the end of the session. So hopefully, inshallah, you can catch the rest of it in the recording. But it seems to this stream may have gotten affected. Apologies for that. Um, the, the next question is, what is the significance of Turgut Al? Okay, I, I received this, uh, this question before, subhanAllah. Uh, and I referred to the, the Tughrut Alp, the founder of the Suljuks, and there is the other Tughrut Alp that people have watched. But as I said, I, I honestly cannot describe in detail every character uh, that we have. So this is why, inshallah, I refer you to the books that we have in our resources. And if you want to look up anyone, you could look them up, inshallah, in these resources. Inshallah. The next is, um, the, sorry, Dr. Walid mentioned that he has posted an hour lecture on Uthman. Where can I find it? Bazira, this can be actually found. Uh, this is part of, I think, our Ramadan 360 series where we did uh, that on Uthman the Great. Uh, no, who was it? I yes. believe that was the series. Yes, that was the session. Uh, so inshallah, Usman Ghazi, you can find the session uh, in the recordings. So if you just search by Dr. Walid Hakim's name, then you'll be able to find all the recordings that he's had on Faith Essentials uh, in the past as well. Uh, the next question is, where is Sheikh Idabali buried? Uh, where is Sheikh Idabali buried? He is actually, uh, you know, subhanAllah, there is, uh, he's buried in, uh, there is a university if you were to type uh, on Google University of Idabali, it's a fully functioning Islamic university that we have in our time, one of the most famous ones in Turkey. And he's not buried very far from that, subhanAllah. So look for the university and you should be able to find uh, Sheikh Idabali near it. May Allah have mercy on him. I mean, that looks like the end of the submitted questions. I don't see apologies. I think that the timing just started right around the beginning of our Q&A when the stream got affected. So I don't see any questions from the live streams right now, except for just comments on the stream. So hopefully you guys can, inshallah, join us afterwards uh, and, and uh, benefit from the recording. But it looks like we've cleared through everything. And Alhamdulillah. And inshallah, based on, based on your survey answers, we may inshallah. launch an Ottoman tour at the end of August, inshallah, for those who would love to join i could i could personally vouch for the safety of uh, especially uh, um, the south part of turkey and we will take all the precautions inshallah that would be taken so that you could be you could learn and be entertained and inshallah uh, you would it would be life transforming for you to see things that you only heard about from us from this live feed Inshallah. And what, if we do go ahead, if the survey is positive, once again, the link for that is ilmpath.com slash survey. If you want to just pitch in and let us know whether or not you, you would think it's a good idea, or you would you would go uh, if you had the opportunity. Um, but if it is positive, will that be posted on the tours section of ilmpath.com? So if you go to tours, would that be posted some, sometime there? Yes, it will be on the on the main page as well, ilmpath.com, inshallah. It would be over inshallah. there. But okay. we, we thought first we want to ask you uh, and, and, and see your concerns as well, inshallah. Uh, and, and that way we learn about uh, not only for the Ottoman, but any of the other histories, inshallah, that we plan in the future, like Sicily and, and Malta and others, inshallah. Okay, thank you for that sneak peek as well. Jazak have you? I don't Jazak think you have taken us to tours, or you have taken tours to Sicily or Malta, have you? It was supposed to be the very first uh, one, subhanAllah. subhanAllah. I, I have a course about the 470 years of Muslim presence in Sicily. If, uh, inshallah. inshallah, I would love to launch that maybe after we finish the Ottoman, inshallah. SubhanAllah. So this will prep us since New Dawn is launching on the Faith Essentials portal this week. That will be a great kind of segue and prep to get us have, ask, having questions for you, inshallah, uh, for hopefully when you have that series as well. Alhamdulillah. That's the beauty, you know, when you study with Sheikh uh, Dr. Abdullah Hakim quick. Yes. Every time you study one of the histories of the world, you have one piece of the puzzle. So you have the Andalus piece of the puzzle, you have the Ottoman, 
you have the Sicily and you have the, uh, the North America as well and the African history. And then something clicks when you put all the puzzle pieces together. SubhanAllah, you have the full picture at that time. SubhanAllah. Get you guys, so you guys can get excited, inshallah, for that launch, inshallah, in the next three days on July 5th. Jazakallah khair once again, Dr. Walid. We look forward to seeing you again uh, next Thursday for Ramadan 360 Group Individuals. You will have that replay of session number two to catch you all up to speed on Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the next live session will be on Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Dr. Walid Hakim, I'll let you go, inshallah. Jazakallah khair for another amazing session. I'm just going to do some housekeeping uh, with the rest of the students, and then we'll close the session in a couple of minutes. Jazakallah Mr. Hafsan. Everyone, thank you very much for coming and see you inshallah next week. Barakallah. Barakallah. Take care. See you then inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum assalamu wa barakatuh. Amazing. Now, Faith the Sensors, I'll let you guys hang out for just a minute or so before we do, before we close off the session. Um, I just wanted to give you some quick reminders. Uh, of course, we have the continuation of this series. We do have a few more series in the works uh, right now. Dr. Ne sorry, Sheikh Navid's uh, series, inshallah, is still a little bit on hold, and we will get you dates for that as soon as we have something uh, something planned. But we do have, for the month of Dhuhijjah, we have a lot of programming coming at you. Uh, please keep an eye out on your emails and on the platform itself. If you are also part of the Ramadan 360 group, mashallah, there's so many of you that are. Uh, we will also be starting a kind of a themed kind of posting, inshallah, in the group to keep you guys uh, kind of remembering some of the lessons that we learned from Ramadan 360 and preparing you for Dhuhijjah 360, inshallah. Uh, so starting with the theme of this week and next week is going to be reconnecting um, the benefits and the positive things that have come out of Corona that have allowed you, you to reconnect uh, with your purpose as a Muslim, with yourself, uh, with your home environment. There's so many benefits with your family, alhamdulillah. So please do share uh, and and uh, and uh, hashtag the themes with, of course, uh, Amagrib 360. Share on your personal pages and in the group so we can all benefit, inshallah. Uh, Jazakallah once again to the Sheikh. And just keep an eye out for new new dawn coming out on July 5th. And I believe that is the last I have for reminders. There's a few exciting things, but they're time specific. So I have to wait until uh, next week so that I can announce them then. So please uh, keep an eye out for that. And for those who are wondering, the Through the Fire Q&A uh, with Sheikh Amar was also posted in the recordings uh, just recently. So you can have a look at that as well. Jazakumul khair for joining us for another live session. Inshallah, I'll catch you next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.